When did you realise that you were actually a good footballer? I feel like everyone's chasing to be a good footballer. I think that's a process. Hopefully I will become one. Um, but I think when I realised that I wanted to pursue it and actually go for it was probably when I was around 16, 17. Um, and that's when I kind of got brought in in a more full-time capacity with the Jets at that point back in Australia. And I saw, you know, the way the women's team was going, the, the World Cups, um, we made the Olympics in the, the Rio, Olymp Rio Olympics. And I realised then that I wanted to be an Olympian and go to a World Cup. Aggie, okay, what about yourself? When did you start to kick a ball about? Um, originally, when I was around four or five, I used to play for my local boys team, and I got scouted by Chelsea back in the day, and then I've been at Chelsea for about nine, ten years, and obviously just signed a new contract there, so I'm really happy with that, and now at Everton, and I'm really enjoying it so far. It's a huge commitment, isn't it, for a young footballer, whether you're a boy or a girl, to start that young at an academy and see it through to the first team. It's a massive commitment, not just for yourself, but for the families as well. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, obviously, a lot of work comes in through the parents as well, taking you to training when you're a little girl. And I'm so grateful for my mum and dad being lucky enough to take me every day. And obviously now they're a bit lucky that they're fortunate I can drive because obviously it makes it easier for myself now. But yeah, no, massive creds to my mum and dad who took me there every day. So yeah. Are you going to be able to play against Chelsea? Unfortunately Sadly not. Sadly not, no. It's quite no. a pain. I'd love to play against them, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, you've played with... Uh, a team managed by Brian Sorensen before, haven't you, Claire? Yeah, I did back in Denmark. I played for Fortuna Joring and I was fortunately enough to be coached by Brian. And at that point, I was really nervous to go overseas with the COVID pandemic and the rules in Australia at the time. You know, it was a bit of permanency in, in leaving the country. You didn't know when you might be able to come back and everything involved. But, you know, Brian and assistant coach Stephen really helped me making that jump. And I had a really good year and I really enjoyed it. We've actually got a message to play. We've got our next video from, uh, from the Everton manager, Brian Sorensen. Hey, uh, yeah, just want to give a great thanks for yeah, everybody welcoming me to, to the club. And uh, it's been amazing. Uh, really enjoyed the time. Uh, had the first experience of playing home in, in, in front of you. Um, and I think it was amazing. We could hear you the entire game. So, uh, yeah. Loving uh, life it is at the moment, and uh, yeah, hope you have a really good evening, and, and see you down at the Walden Hall Park against Chelsea on Sunday. What is it about Brian, about Brian Sonnen Sinclair, that makes you want to play for his teams? Um, I think about Brian, it's his style of play. I think, you know, it was evident in our game against Liverpool, you know, the style of play that we want to play, the 3-4-3 and just keeping the ball the way that we do. And I really enjoy it. Um, being a defensive midfielder, I love all the ball that I can, that I can get. Um, and he had that style in, in Denmark and it really worked for us. We qualified for the Champions League and it was a great year for us there and we won the cup. And I don't see why we can't have similar success here. What was the thought process for you, Aggie, to come to Everton on loan from Chelsea? Um, I think for me it was kind of a decision that was very easy to make in the end. I was at Bristol last year on loan, managed to get the game time I needed over there and came back to Chelsea, had pre-season there and we had another discussion about coming on loan and I quickly got in touch with Brian and he was really keen to take me on board and he has a great nature for developing young talent and being an Evertonian really appealed to me and I love it here so far, so I'm really happy that I decided to come here. How important was it for you to have that loan spell at Bristol? Did it, did it develop you as a player and as a person? Yeah, no, definitely. I think looking back now, I can see how much it developed me. Definitely gained confidence and obviously being in the Chelsea environment, it's hard to play there when I'm against the likes of Sam and Beth. So I think being on loan really helped me out, developed me as a player as well and a person. So yeah, very grateful for the time at Bristol. Settled in well? Yeah, no, I love it here. The girls are a really t tight knit group. The fans are brilliant. The coaching staff's amazing. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Tell us about Tim Cahill. How much in a, of an influence is he on every single person in Australia who kicks a football? Yeah, if, he went, if, he, if he went for presidency, he'd win it, wouldn't he? I mean, <laughs> no, nah, Tim Cahill has, you know, certainly has a grip on Australian football and, and everyone's minds. And, you know, him himself, like thinking about his goal in the 2014 World Cup, you know, screamer of a volley. And, you know, he's 
you know, he used football in Australia and we have that now in the likes of Sam Kerr as well on the women's side of things. But, you know, obviously he had a really great spell here and he stayed for many years and, you know, Hayley Rousseau as well in the women's side of things and Everton's been a good club to us Aussies and, and yeah, it definitely was um, something to consider. When you moved to, to Denmark, that, that, that was a huge step for you, wasn't it? Again, the same, similar question to, to the one opposed to Aggie. Did that help you develop as a, as a person and a player, uprooting from Australia to go to Denmark to play for Brian in, uh, in Joring? Yeah, I think there's definitely an all-in aspect in it. I think, obviously, moving to different continents and different time zones away from your family, your friends, and, and going, this is it, this is what I want to pursue. And it was definitely that all-in moment for me. And, you know, now that I'm here and um, I'm in England, and this was always my goal to, to play in England, and I'm, I'm so happy that it is is Everton, a club that's had a big history with other Aussies. And, yeah, it was, I think, that first step that I needed to take, and I took it. Aggie, the, one of the many, many massive positives about the, the growth, the rapid growth of women's football is that there's a, there's a pathway now, and the pathway is illuminated for a young girl. If a young girl wants to be a professional footballer, she can go for it because the dream is there. Yeah, no, for sure. I think especially with the women winning the Euros this year, I think it's only going upwards. And I think with all the promotion that's going on as well, that women can play too, and that the standard is just as good as the men's. And I think with time, it's going to, progressively get better and better and I think now the times it's most exciting now and me and Claire are lucky enough to be able to do it every day and do the sport that we love. How massive was it for the for the for the, the Lionesses to win the Euros because it just it just gripped the entire nation some of the scenes you scenes that you never thought you'd see at a women's football match. Yeah no for sure I mean the goals that Alessio Russo scored are going to go down in history as well and I think it's nice. I remember coming home one night after it and some man who was just some 50-year-old lad at the pub, he was like, I just watched the women's game and I had my little England shirt on. And he was like, it's brilliant to see it's coming along the way it is. Because I think it's especially it's brilliant that the, the women won it instead of the men as well. Because, I mean, <laughs> it makes a difference. Everyone talking about the men winning it and then the women bring it home. I think for me personally, I really enjoyed it. So. <laughs> What did you make of the Euros, Claire? I mean, obviously, as a proud Australian, you don't ever want us to win a cricket match. But, and we usually oblige when we're in Australia anyway. Uh, what about the Euros? Did you, obviously, because it was going to be such a shot in the arm for the women's game, were you pleased, reasonably pleased, to see England win? Or did you not give a monkeys? <laughs> I mean, I'm on camera, so I have to speak uh, candidly. But, um, no, look, in, in, the, in the spirit of the women's game, you know, I think it was just great to see you know, England in, as a whole get behind, you know, the, the scenes of the crowds, you know, the sellout um, stadiums, it's good to see. And, you know, the next World Cup's in Australia and I, I hope we can replicate that, if not do better and, um, you know, get the crowds and get the people behind women's football and hopefully it's the best World Cup to date for the women's and, um, yeah. W will it grip the Australian public the way the Euros grip the English public this year? Yeah, look, there's definitely, we, we love sport in Australia, so there's definitely that aspect of it. And I think, you know, the game is growing, not just in England, not just in Europe, but everywhere. And I think hopefully we can learn from what um, you guys did really well here and with the marketing and with really getting behind the team and do the exact same. It's fantastic, isn't it, to see young girls go into a football match with a women's football top on and a women's name on the back of the shirt. Yeah, no, and it, even more than that, it's good to see not only that it's, just young girls, but it's young boys, and it's you know it's it's men wearing women's shirts, and it's just it doesn't matter who you are, or what team you go for, you're just going for your team, going for your nation, and that's it's really good to see. Emma Hayes is making a name for herself as a as a popular pundit, watching the men's games. Aggie, what's it like to play for Emma Hayes? Yeah, no, I mean at first it was surreal when I got put up into the first team from the academy, and I remember. <coughs> literally forgetting how to pass the ball when she was first there. But, I mean, she's a great person, a great coach, obviously. She's, she wants the best for the team. She creates a fantastic environment for players to learn and develop. And, obviously, she wants to win titles. She's out for the Champions League this year. Um, I mean, it's an honour to be a part of one of her players. And I have so much uh, gratitude and gratefulness for what she's done for me. And I just hope that I can live up to her expectations for me. Is that the aim for Everton? Is that the next step to, to close the gap? Because there was a gap last season between the top four and the rest. And, and do we want to be the best of the rest? Is that the next aim? Yeah, I think for sure. I th like, definitely. I don't see why we wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, 
Brian's come in and you can tell already he's got a great aspiration for the team and it's so doable. I mean, I think if anyone came to our training, you'd see the standard that we're at. And I think we constantly push each other to be better every single day. And I think it's more than doable. I mean, the Liverpool game at Anfield managed to score three goals and I think it was a really successful day for us. And I think it's only onwards and upwards for Everton. And obviously it's a shame where they finished last year, but I think it's more than doable to finish top table this year. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that game at Anfield when we beat Liverpool by three goals <laughs> to nil. Yeah, um, throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we've got the highlights to show you. Now, <laughs> Aggie and Claire didn't play in that game, but let's face it, when we all get together, if an Everton team have beaten Liverpool 3 0, we want to see the highlights. Yeah. This is the pick of the action from when Everton went to Anfield and beat Liverpool 3 0. They plays it through looking for that far post. It's not quite clear the way. Graham was in there too, and so was George. And it just went over. Everton moments away from getting there first. Here's Finnegan. Takes a shot from distance. It was a very good effort too to say from Laws. Faye with the delivery. And it over. Finnegan's there again. And this time she does get the goal. Megan Finnegan for Everton. Breaks the deadlock. Right place, right time. Her brilliant header sends it past Laws. They again, always bubbling, and they look dangerous. And Laws is absolutely furious with her defenders. And they was allowed to get a shot away. Oh, picked up here by Stengel. Could she take full advantage? That's taking a little bit long. Shot comes in, and it goes wide. This should be disappointed. Enrique Sivica just took too long to make her mind up. And Stengel. Thought she could take advantage, but sees her shot go wide. Lovely pass that is. This is Park. Can she make it too? Yes, she can. What a finish. Jess Park. With a fine finish for Everton to get their second. And they are in control of this Merseyside derby. Missy Bo Kearns with the corner. Alison tried to clear it away, but they can't quite get it away. Flaherty getting in there too, and this time it's Holland. Well, her curving shot didn't quite have enough curl on it to find the back of the net. Matthias Nuis spotted Christiansen to a left. Nice pass from Christiansen, and Snooze couldn't get on the end of it. All it needed was a stretching leg from Snooze to try and tap it in. She couldn't quite reach it. Campbell. With that delivery in. Almost missed there by Courtney Brosnan. Just mistimed a jump, didn't she? Well, she can laugh about it now. Well, great work from the uh, substitute Geo, and this is Park. Lays it off to Benison. And it's a third for Everton. Hannah Benison, who was a second half substitute. Well, it was a brilliant pass from Park to find Benison. She still had to be clever with the finish. And she did just that. And that is surely the three points wrapped up now for Everton. Daniels. Back out to Holland. This is Furness. Daniels is there. Couldn't quite get the connection she wanted. 
And just bounced up perfectly into the hands of Brosnan. Here's Daniels again. Finds Roberts. Roberts looking for Stengel. And it's just been one of those evenings for Stengel. But it's Everton who get their first three points of the WSL season. Absolutely fantastic. What does a, a result and a performance like that do for the squad, Claire? I think it definitely builds um, momentum. It's good to get the three points um, on the table. Points matter in this league. And it was, I think, huge for us just to finally get those points on the table. And, you know, we carried that momentum through the next week against Leicester and got to go into the international break with six points, which was good. I was going to mention that it was the first win of the season, Aggie. We lost narrowly against West Ham United in the first game. So how important was it to, to get off the mark, regardless of the fact that it was Liverpool? How important was it to get off the mark? Yeah, no, like Claire said, it's a very competitive league. And I mean, if we want to finish where we want to finish this year, we need to get as many points as we can. And I think obviously doing it against Liverpool is great, but being able to do it week in, week out is our aim. Like Claire said, we were lucky enough to do it. Well, we were good enough to do it against Leicester and it's just continuing the momentum. Obviously, it'd be brilliant if we get the points against Chelsea as well and continue that momentum. So, yeah. How tough a game is that going to be? You'll know better than anybody. <laughs> Yeah, no, it will be tough. I mean, they are a great team. Everyone does know it. But I think it's nothing that Everton, as a team, we can't handle. We know the strategy that we have, and it's just delivering it on the day. Walton Hall Park is sold out for the game against Chelsea. How good is that? I mean, it just shows where the game is going. Um, our Leicester game was sold out as well, and I think it ties back into the growth of the women's game. It's only going up, and... Um, hopefully, you know, the, the rest of the seasons is the same. You know, it's just going to keep selling out and it's just the game's just going to keep growing. It makes a real difference, doesn't it, when the girls run out at Welton Hall Park and, and it's full and they're making a noise? Definitely. I think it definitely um, makes a difference. You know, unfortunately, you know, me and Aggie both have um, injuries and we have to be on the sideline and we, we notice it as well. You know, we're, we're hearing everyone chant, we're hearing the supporters um, also chant and get behind us and it's great. You know, it's, it really inspires us. And there will be games at Goodison Park as well this season, Aggie. How much are you looking forward to that? Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it. We had the open training session here um, a few, a month ago maybe. And even the fans coming out here. So I'm excited to see when it's an actual game and get, hopefully get as many tickets sold as possible and get the win. We are one of five teams in WSL on six points. So technically we're joint top. <laughs> <laughs> we're fifth, but we're joint top. We're, 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 we're on six points. But Aggie, okay, we've got a tough run of games coming up, haven't we? Yeah, no, we have. I mean, I think for us as a team, we're more taking the approach of one game at a time. So we don't get ahead of ourselves, especially with... It can, con it can change within one week. Like obviously, like you said, five teams join currently join top. So, I mean, it constantly changes. And I think the main focus for us is play Chelsea, see whatever happens, and then go from there, learn from our mistakes. And then whoever we play, hopefully play the good football that we know we can play and get the three points. Have you put WhatsApp blocks on all your Chelsea teammates in case they're <laughs> in touch I've, this week? I messaged a few of them asking what the tactics are. But <laughs> obviously... Wish the best for them and obviously wish the best for us and we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> In the next few games, half a dozen games or so, we play Chelsea, Manchester City, Tottenham and Manchester United, Claire. But I suppose they're the games that you, you come to WSL for. They're the games you want to play in, aren't they? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think... Um, you know, just looking at the, the league in general, the first couple of games, you know, Liverpool beat uh, Chelsea and, you know, Aston Villa beat Man City. Like, anyone can lose on the day and everyone can win. And I think, you know, that's our mentality too. You know, yeah, there's some respect there but um, with those t bigger teams. But I think with the, the late, with the league where it is, anyone can win at any time. You just need to turn up and do the right things. How good is it to be at Finch Farm, Aggie, to have every team at Finch Farm, the academy teams, the men's under-21s and the first team and the women's team as well, all, all under the one roof? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, we're lucky enough to use the same facilities as the men and access the pool when we need it. And I think, <laughs> and I think it's um, obviously a good thing because then it's all equal and it's all the same. And I think the next step is obviously trying to get the same amount of fans as the men do just to see that the women are as good as the men and I think it's a brilliant facility at Finch Farm so we're lucky to be able to be there. 
What kind of dressing room have you got, Claire? You could see from the, the men on stage before, they're a really close-knit bunch. They like to have a laugh at the right time. Is that the same for you? Definitely. <laughs> I, th I, th I think um, it's, it's great because you know, this is a, a lot of new people have come to this team and I think in such a short time we've actually bonded really well and we've really got to know each other and, you know, the dressing room, I think you'd think the team's been together for years, the way we've been and I think you can actually see that as well on the field, the way we get behind each other and, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, if you came to a training, you'd get that vibe too. <laughs> That's the way it has to be, isn't it? If it seems going to be successful, they've got to bond together. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, you know, you're in and you're out with national team all the time and it's just important that people, when they come in, they're in. Everyone's on the same page, everyone's working together and that's what we have. What's the aim for you this season then, Aggie, moving forward? Um, I think for me personally is to be a sponge to all the information I get, whether it's positive, whether it's stuff I need to work on. But I think collectively as a team, which is probably the most important, I think is being able to deliver the football like we know we can play. And I think it's doing consistently is the difference between the top teams and the bottom teams. Like, it's brilliant that we beat Liverpool, but we've got to be able to do it week in, week out and play the likes of Chelsea, Man City, the top teams, and be able to deliver a really so strong performance against them. Just make sure with every single media interview that you do between now and the end of the season, you do get that line in, we beat Liverpool. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, definitely. It will go down very, very well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, two fantastic speakers, Aggie Beaver-Jones and Claire Wheeler. Uh, two fantastic ambassadors for the women's team and they're going to draw the raffle now. So I think you've all got raffle tickets.